Okay. Praise the Lord. So welcome everyone. I want to welcome our viewing audience as well. We are continuing our series on the power of a resurrected life. And last week, we were, we were looking at, um, we've been going through Luke 24, and we're looking at the synoptic gospels and seeing all the parallels on what happened when Jesus rose from the dead. What was the circumstances of his death, the quickness of his burial, how they wrapped him in linen, how the you know, women went to the grave, to uh, wondering who's going to move the stone out of the way so that they can go ahead and put spices on his body. Because that's how quick they had to bury him. Right? But there were no spices. That was a traditional thing to do in uh, ancient times in, in Israel and in other cultures <clears throat> to prepare them for burial they would put spices. But there'd be no spices because the man, capital M, who was in that grave was not going to stay there for very long. Okay? So, I just want to um, read you from Luke 24, first, verse 5. It says, And they were afraid once they showed up, the angels, and they bowed down to the earth. And then they said to him, Why seek ye the living among the dead? And we preached a lot on that, about that message. He is not here, but he is risen, as he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered unto the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again, and they remembered his words. And last week I was telling you, what do you remember? Right? Uh, some of us probably don't even remember when we got saved. Which is kind of sad. And hopefully most of us do. The sense of revelation, of knowing that He loved you so much that He died for you on the cross. That your sins were forgiven. That your sins were removed. The joy and the ecstasy of becoming a child of God. And back in those days, you prayed and your prayers were answered like this. And then now it's like you wait a long time for your prayers to be answered and you're wondering what's going on. I've heard a lot of preachers say uh, over the years that, well, you know, uh, it's almost like God gave you freebies because you're a newbie. And that now, you know, you've been saved longer than it's harder. That, that is so unscriptural. I used to believe that. That is so unscriptural. Today, we're going to talk about what are hindering your prayers. And trust me, it's not him. That work on the cross was so complete, it covered you from the moment of your birth until you stand in His presence. All of your sins completely removed. I mean completely removed. I mean anything stupid that you're going to do when you walk out of here has already been nailed on that cross. It was nailed on that cross almost 2,000 years ago. Yeah. Right? Now that doesn't mean it gives us a license to go and to sin and whatever. That doesn't mean that. But what it means is that the cross is final. Okay? It's not a question mark. It's not a semicolon. It's not a comma. It is the biggest period that you can find followed by a gigantic exclamation point. It is finished. And I want to start there before I get into this message because what's holding you back? You know, a balloon that's anchored down like that, it's not on the ground, it's in the air, but it's not rising any higher. We get saved, <clears throat> salvation comes, and we, we rise, and then somehow we stop, and we can't seem to go any further. Prayers are a struggle, meditating on the Word is a struggle. It seems like all of life has turned against us, all hell has broken loose, and we're like, well, where's the Lord in all this? Yeah. I'm going to answer those questions today, if God and time permits. I want to start with this beautiful thing that Pastor Sharon this is a quote from her. Many of people's problems would never see the light of day if they knew how deeply, they lo how deeply loved they are. Jesus loved you first. Jesus loved you best. And his love will carry you through the rest of your life. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you live your life like that's true? Mm -hmm. Okay. See? Because I had to ask myself the same question. Okay? Okay, because the Lord said to me, do you believe that? And I said, yes, do you live your life like that? And you know what? I had to stop for a minute, and I had to think about it. It's a long, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a long, mm -hmm. yeah. Because I had to wonder, like, you know what? Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't. When I uh, get strange things, you know, if I, if I go to the doctor, and they're like, oh, we don't, we got to send you for this because we don't know this. And then, I, you know, you start to, Right? Anytime you hear a report about anybody, a loved one, who's sick, 
You know, Pastor Joe's not with us today because he's sick, right? Now, I know Pastor Sharon's an only child. She loves her parents. But when we heard he wasn't feeling well, you start to get afraid. And then the enemy comes and starts whispering in your ear, you know he's 83 years old. Mm-hmm. And you know the response is, who cares how old he is? Age means nothing to God because he paid for it on the cross. Mm-hmm. Anything that will cut your life short was nailed on that cross. But you can believe it. Mm-hmm. See, Jesus didn't say you're going to get what you say. He says, what you believe is what you will receive. Mm-hmm. When they said to him, Lord, he said to one man, what, what, did I, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And he said, according to your faith, be it unto you. Believest thou that I can do these things? Yea, Lord, according to your faith, be it unto you. He never said, according to what comes out of your mouth. According to your hashabahim, be it unto you. See, people have a misconception of what faith is. Faith is not, I take my problems, and I throw it over the fence, and let God worry about it. Right? For example, I'll give you an example. Look, you know, we, we try to be practical around here. Let's say, for example, you're watching this message, and let's say, for example, <clears throat> you're going through some financial difficulties. You're having some financial challenges. There's some difficulties going on in your life, and, um, you know, and you're like, well, you know, God will take care of it. God's, you know, yeah, I'm not going to worry about it. And you take that bill that came in, let's say it's your mortgage, right? And you just shove it in your drawer. God will take care of it. And you go about your day. You forget that there's a, a bill or your mortgage bill in that drawer. So you go about, you know, God's going to take care of it. And you go about your business. And then the next month you get another bill. And you just throw it in the drawer. So God's going to take care of it. You keep doing that after a few months, I guarantee you the sheriff will come to take your house. Right? You know, it's not taking your problems, it's throwing it in the drawer. Right. You take your problems and you bring it and you lay it at his feet. Yeah. And say, Lord, like the King Jehoshaphat said, Lord, we have no might against this company, and neither do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. And then the word of the Lord came. Right? Lord, I don't know. I don't listen, I got this much money, and this is how much debt I have. I don't know what to do. But my eyes are upon you. So I bring it to your feet and I pay what I can. I ask you for favor. And you call those people up and say, hey, I need some more time. No, we're not giving you no more time. Okay, well, okay. Then that's, that you've heard, you understood. It is what it is. Right? But what you want to try to do is you don't want to take around and, and, uh, you don't want to take, take that time and, just throw it in the drawer. You bring it, you lay it at his feet, and you say, you know what? I don't know what to do. Right? <clears throat> Confess your faults one to another. Pray you one for another, you may be healed. How is debt a fault? Because nobody put a gun to your head to get yourself into debt. I can tell you that because I know. That's, that's not what happens. Right? You make decisions. Now, sometimes things are without your control. A person loses their job and they live off their credit cards. I mean, what are you supposed to do? All I'm saying is that there are decisions that we make that we don't bring the Lord into the decision-making process. Right. Mm-hmm. We just say, oh, I can't pay my bills, so I'll, use, I'll rob Peter from Peter to pay Paul. What if we stopped and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I can tell you a true event. True, you know, many of you know what Pastor Sharon and I have gone through the last three years. Uh, losing a job, God throwing us into ministry, right? It was literally kind of like, I felt like I was back in the army jumping out of the plane. Although it felt like I didn't have a parachute at one point. But regardless, and so, you know, we face, you know, the loss of income and all these other things. And then pastoring a church, starting a church, all these challenges. But you know what? We reached a point where it was like, we had to make a payment on the car and we didn't have money. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, brother, now it's time for you to walk what you've been preaching. So I said, I, we literally took it and laid it at his feet and said, well, here it is. If you don't make get to us, we don't get the money to pay this payment. You know, we're going to have to do something. We called the bank, uh, the car thing, they gave us an extension of two months and all this other stuff. But now all of that has gone. Now it's like, okay, we need money. If we don't get money, then, you know, we're going to have to get this car back. So, the day that we had to make a payment, we found an envelope in our mailbox. Mm-hmm. From 
somebody who we would have never in a million years have thought this person would have even thought of us, much less show that level of kindness, and wrote a check for the exact amount of the car payment, $450. And I, I was like rejoicing. You know what the Lord said to me? He said to me, what did you think was going to happen? I said, honestly, I didn't think anything was going to happen. That's why nothing happens. That's what he said to me. You have to believe and trust me. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Do you really believe that? I said, Lord, you know what? I'm starting to believe. You see, we wonder, why do we go through difficult times? Why, why is life so difficult? Why do we go through these challenges? First of all, 99.9% .9 of the time, we open the door. We open the door for the enemy to come in. Paul said, give no place to the devil, and we do. Amen. By fearing, by worrying, by being angry and offended because somebody did this and that. We open the door, and we open ourselves to attack. But even when we don't, Jesus says, in this life, you will have tribulations and trials, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Best case scenario, so under the best of circumstances, trial, trouble will come, under the best of circumstances. Unfortunately, we tend to live in the worst of circumstances because we tend to open the door for the enemy to come in and attack us. Right? But we pray, and what do we expect to happen? Because, honestly, in that moment, that was the grace of God. Because, honestly, I didn't think anything was going to happen. But God overrode my faith to show me grace. To teach me a lesson. What did you think was going to happen? I said, nothing. So why did you pray to me? I said, because I was kind of hoping maybe you'd feel sorry for me and give me the money. <laughs> and he said to me, I love you. And that's why I show you I am in control of your finances, not you. You didn't get yourself into this situation. I allowed it to happen. To teach you something about me that you haven't known of to this point. And I got to tell you, for the last three years, has been one of the most difficult and the most challenging, both financially, emotionally, and in every other aspect. But I know without a shadow of a doubt what he did for me on that cross. And I may not be in the fullness of everything. I haven't yet received. There are things that I'm still waiting on. But I am no longer waiting, hoping it'll happen. I am waiting with the expectation that it will happen. Mm -hmm. Because God always keeps his promises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's not a man. He doesn't change his mind. Mm -hmm. He didn't change his mind. When he hung on that cross, he thought of each one of us. And everything that's facing you right now, he took it on that cross. But then how do we know, Pastor? Well, we got to wait. The discipline of restraint. We have to control ourselves. We just want to run out. Oh, I got a credit card, so let me go out and, and you know, do this. And let me go out and do that because I can do, you know. Well, but no, what if you just stop for a moment and say, Lord, I got to make a decision by this date. There's nothing wrong with that. To believe me, I told the Lord, if you don't answer, if you don't let me know by 11 o'clock on Thursday night, when I get up in the morning, I'm going to have to do something. And this is what I'm going to do. I remember one time, years ago, I was gonna, we were going to go into business, and I had all business plans and everything else, because I, I, you know, I was a banker at the time. And I thought, well, you know, they eliminated my position. I thought, okay, this is great. And I gave God a hard deadline. That Saturday was coming, and I was excited, because it was Wednesday, and nothing was happening. And then, I'm like, woohoo! So, all right, Lord, Saturday... Saturday's coming. And the next day, Thursday, I woke up. Woohoo, nothing. Saturday's coming. Now, mind you, I didn't take the, the bill and throw it in the thing. I kept looking for jobs. I was post sending my resume out. I was interviewing on the phone, and I was going on interviews. All right? Because I was like, you know what? If you're going to close every single door, I'm going to make sure that when I jump out of that plane, parachute or not, I'm going out that door, I told the Lord. All I got back was a smile. I was like, all right, here we go. Thursday afternoon, I get a phone call. It's like, who's this? I pick up the phone, and it was somebody who I knew from my days back at Jacob Morgan. He goes, hey, you know, so, you know, I hear that you're looking for work, whatever. I said, mm, yeah. He goes, yeah, we got this position open. Give this, I told the dude about it, give him a call. I was like, oh, really, Lord? I was like, all right. I picked up the phone, I called the guy back. 
I mean the other guy. And I said, you know what, he's probably not going to pick up, so I'll just leave a message. The guy picked up the phone. <laughs> I was like, yeah, so, you know, yeah, you know, yeah, Charlie, you're telling me a lot. Because this guy who I knew was like a senior executive at this bank, right? So they were probably just wanting to talk to me out of the fact that they didn't want to tick the guy off. So I was like, cool, they're just going to talk to me, and then, you know, we'll just move on. Saturday's coming, right? No. He's like, can you come tomorrow for an interview? <laughs> I'm like, seriously, Lord? So I go to the interview. I go to the thing. I'm thinking I'm talking to this guy, this woman. And he goes, you know, whatever. We're going to let you know. So I was like, all right, now now it's Friday. I can't do nothing because now I got to see what. But, you know, they're probably going to pass me on because this other dude's won't qualify. And, you know, just go. And I'm all fired up. Oh, no. Did I tell you God has a sense of humor? Tuesday or Wednesday of the next week. Call me up, say you want to extend your offer. Was the recruiter from Sega? And I remember where we were. I was sitting at the edge of our bed in our bedroom, and I closed the phone, and we both started crying because we really wanted to go into business together. Mm -hmm. But see, God had a better plan about business. See, you guys are thinking business. I'm thinking ministry. I'm thinking pastoring, right? And it's the same thing. I applied to over 200 jobs. Okay. With 20 years of experience doing banking, I mean, I knew off the back of my hand, I knew a lot of people. Every door was closed. Because the Lord said, that's it, buddy. We're moving on. And I remember it. See, I know what no is. And so God tells you no, you keep believing. Mm -hmm. And you keep moving forward and you keep your plans. But trust me, when he tells you to no, you better stop. Because if you're still doing, he tells you no, now you're in rebellion. Mm -hmm. And now you're just... Open territory for the enemy to come in and do whatever he wants to do. You don't want that. Right? The Old Testament, to obey is better than sacrifice, to hearken than the battle rams. But when he tells you no, and I've known, it was like a hard, we're done. Move on. Mm -hmm. Alright? Because he's very loving, but when you start to get what we call in Spanish, necio, mm -hmm. okay? I have my sisters laughing, they know what my, my brother was. <laughs> necio is like, you know what? You know better, and you're still being a pain, you're still being stubborn, you're still being a whiny baby, then the voice becomes a little stern. Stop. Enough. We're done. I said, okay, we're done. I don't know what you're going to do, but we're done. And then the thing of it is, I never realized how much I wanted to be in control of my life until this thing that's happened the last three years, both of us. How much of control freaks we were until you are no longer in control. When you find the risk of losing your house, when you find the, you know, the, and you know what? Somehow God fed us. Yes. God sustained us through the love of the people, through the giving of uh, the faithful giving of the people in this church. It was just enough. Notice it wasn't push you over, because the Lord was like, I am going to teach you to trust me for everything, mm -hmm. right? Because whichever way you go is the way the church is going to go. So if you can't trust me, they won't either. If you don't know how much I love you, they won't either. Mm -hmm. You have to be convinced and converted to in your form of thinking. Mm -hmm. So, I say all that to me, what? Because there's a lot of things that, this is the core of everything. If you don't know God loves you, there's nowhere, you, you can't pray with confidence. Right. You can't witness with confidence. Mm -hmm. You can't do any of it. You can't read your Bible with any kind of level of confidence. You can't go through life with any level of confidence. And worse yet, you are going to feel that it's all on you. Mm -hmm. If I don't do it, nobody's going to help me. And that's exactly what the enemy wants you to do. So you have to be convicted. You know, with you, the church uses conviction always in the negative way. You have to be, uh, you know, convicted of, uh, you know, Convicted of sin. You have to be convicted of your sin. And convict, listen, you have to be convicted. And biblical conviction, it means a strong belief or an opinion. The belief of being sure that what you believe or say is true. You want to know what you're convicted of? Look to your mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever you rehearse, whether it's your problems, your your sickness, your disease, your infirmities, your difficulties, that is what you're convicted of. That is what's captivated your thought process. You've got to change your belief because let me tell you, the cross is a reality. You've been washed by that precious blood. 
You don't want to belong to yourself. And you definitely don't belong to the devil. He's not your father anymore. Mm -hmm. You have a real father, a real God, who lives in a real heaven and lives inside of you. Think about what convicted you when you came to Jesus. Right? Something, you became a Christian, you believe you became born again. Or else it's not, it's, if it's all head knowledge, you can forget about it. If you're listening to this message and it's all head knowledge to you, well, how do I know if it's head knowledge? Well, when the trumpet blows and you're still here, then you'll know <laughs> that it was all in your head and not in your heart. Amen. You probably won't even hear the trumpet blow because the only people are going to hear the trumpet. I don't know. I, I guess maybe not. You know, God is the type because that's going to start a seven-year period of tribulation that maybe everybody's going to hear that trumpet. And people are going to be terrified. What's that sound? And they thing you know they're going to turn and their spouse is gone. It could be. I don't know. But if you hear it and you're still here after it's done, then you know that it was all in your head and not in your heart. Right. And this ministry is about getting Jesus in your heart. Mm -hmm. And if Jesus is already in your heart, is to allow the Jesus is in your heart to work out your salvation. Yes, amen. Work it out from the inside out. Amen. You have to have a strong belief and opinion that you are loved. Yes. That's the first thing. Yes. I am loved. I don't care how messed up you are. I don't care what kind of devilment you're in. I don't care how backslidden you are. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the scripture is very clear in Romans. What say it? That the word is not Even in your heart and in your mouth, that is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And guess what? Salvation is not just a single thing. You heard that in church. Well, it's true, God doesn't have grandchildren. That's true, He only has children. But, salvation is a family thing. You say, what? Let me tell you something. What's important to you is important to God. Yeah. And trust me, if you love your children, God loves them more. Because He sent His Son to die for their sins, even if they don't know Him. Okay? I can prove it to you scripturally. Paul and Silas in the jail, at the midnight hour, worshiping. Earthquake, jail opened, chains fell. The jailer woke up from his stupor and was about to kill himself. And they said to him, don't kill yourself, we're all here. And the man fell on his knees and said to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You think he was thinking about his wife in that moment? No. You think he was thinking about his kids? No. You think he was thinking about his servants? Absolutely not. He thought about himself because he just saw that God was real. But even in his selfish need for salvation, what did Paul say to him? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household will be saved. And you're like, well, 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 Pastor, that's just one verse. Okay. Cornelius, when Peter preached, today salvation has come to us. Jesus to Zechariah, to Zacchaeus. Salvation is not just your salvation, it is to everyone around you that means something to you. Mm -hmm. That's how God works. God isn't selfish. He is generous. Let me tell you something. That blood flowed freely that day. It wasn't like, well, let me just do a drop. It flowed so much, he had no more blood in him when they buried him. He said to them, come feel, I am flesh and bone. He had no more blood in him. He didn't withhold anything back from us on that day. He shed that blood for everyone who was, who is, and who is yet to be born throughout all eternity. Your God is an incredibly generous God. But we live as if He's stingy. No, He's generous. He's generous. And we have to have a strong belief in an opinion that you are loved. And when you say, God loves me, <coughs> make sure that when you pray every day, prayer is not something like, oh my God, I don't know how to pray. Listen, do you know how to talk? Oh, yeah. Right? You know how to talk. You know how to talk about your problems and all that <laughs> stuff, right? <laughs> Prayer is conversating, in conversation with your father. Mm -hmm. Tell him, you know, I, 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 I can't believe how much you love me. I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense. I'm a mess, but I am grateful that you love me. Mm -hmm. Confess something different. Yes. But first, you've got to believe something different because you don't get what you say, you get what you believe. Mm -hmm. 
So you have to change the way you believe. And it's very simple. Paul said, be not conformed to this world. Don't be like everybody else, whining and complaining. But be ye transformed. And that word transformation is transmogorical in the Greek, I believe. But it means it's the, what a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. Mm. Through the renewing of your mind. Stop thinking about your problems and mm. start thinking about your solution. Amen. Your solution to whatever your problem is right now, debt collectors, uh, bill collectors, medical issues, whatever, there's the solution. And it was paid for already. All you're waiting to do is for God to make it accessible to you. You have to calm your mind. You know, see, a lot of times, people in the world have this whole transcendental meditation and all this other stuff. And so the church has just moved away from the concept of meditation. Where in the world do you think the world got meditation from? The church! Right? Be anxious in nothing, but in everything, through prayer, with supplication and thanksgiving, bring your request before God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And whatsoever things are true, and noble. But what do you think? You're meditating. Meditate on these things. Yeah, yeah. We just stopped meditating because the church told us that that's demonic. No, the devil don't want you meditating because he knows if you start meditating what he did on there, your belief system is going to change yeah. and what comes out of your mouth is going to come to pass. Mm -hmm. Sin is no longer an issue. Sin is the one thing that people, you know, and let me tell you something. Sin is not just fornicating and adultery and all the other major things that we all think about all the time. Because the first people that are hurled into that lake of fire are the fearful and the doubtful. And I thank God for the blood of Jesus because I can't tell you how many times I've doubted God, how many times I've been afraid, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, right? To even insult a brother is considered murder by the court of heaven. God has a very different standard than we do. His standards are up here, very high. And without that cross, none of us would have been able to preach it, mm -hmm. to bridge that. That cross bridged that vast divide between us and God. And that just restored us to what the garden. Because Adam wasn't a son, we are children. We are the seed of heaven, born of water and spirit. God has a vested interest in us because we're his. So sin's been dealt with. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. I will remember it no more. Now here's something that you need to understand this morning. And it is this. Whatever you're in the middle of right now that's not godly, whatever you're doing that's not godly, whatever thoughts you have that are not godly, whatever you're going to do tomorrow that's a holiday, that's ungodly. He, rem he doesn't remember it. There will be consequences. I will tell you that right now. Mm -hmm. Because a good father will discipline you. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't remember your sin. He just deals with your acts. I'm going to say this again. He no longer remembers your sins. He deals with your actions. And that's how you get disciplined. Not because of the sin you committed. By the act of what you did. Because if he deals with your sin, then you're not washing the blood of Jesus. Which brings me to another point. If you're going through life with no troubles and no issues, and then you're listening to this message online or on, on public access television, and you're like, Pastor, I don't know what you're talking about. I just, you know, I love the Lord and life is just good, and I've been saved for 10 or 15 years, and I don't go through any difficulties. I think you better get on your knees and repent and actually get saved. Because the scripture says, if you don't receive any whipping, then you are a bastard and not a son. Because he scourges every son whom he receives. And I wish I could tell you there's a nice translation to scourging, but scourging means I take the belt and I whip you. And here's the wonderful thing, or not so wonderful thing, for those of us who've been saved a while, is that the big ones are the ones that get whipped, not the little ones. Right? You know, human parents, and I have several parents here, right, will take their children, the older ones, they'll just ground them, take the car keys away, or, you know, you know Xbox privileges, or whatever. You don't hit them. The little ones are the ones that, you know, you spank them, whatever. God does a reverse. He speaks to the little ones, and he whips the big ones. So if you're boasting that you're spiritually mature, and I have arrived, then get ready for that belt. Trust me, and it's never pleasant. It's always done in love, but it is never pleasant. You know, your devilment will get you into some mess, and God will take advantage of the mess that you got yourself into to teach you a lesson. For this man, 
after he had offered, that man is Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. For those of you who remember the tabernacle series that I did about a year ago, the priest never sat. There's no chairs inside the holy place. And there's definitely no chair in the holy of holies. Because God's throne is in it. Nobody sits in God's presence. Old Testament. Guess what? Here's Jesus. He's sitting down and he's the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Why? Because his work is done. See, this is the stuff that you need to remind yourself of. Not your problems, not your issues, not what your loved ones are going through. And don't be afraid, well, what if my, you know, something happens to my father or my mother or this and that. I promise you, he loves them more than you love them. He will preserve them. Because what's important to you is important to him. Do you believe that? That's what I've been called to do. To preach to you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to preach good news to you. Yes, to set at liberty them that are bound. To declare the acceptable year of the Lord. This today, today, the scripture says, harden not your hearts as they did in the visitation of the universe. Don't. Listen. Embrace. Don't walk out of here and be like, okay, this is a nice message and then let's go see what we're going to eat this afternoon. Restrain yourself, like Pastor Sharon says, to take a moment in that car as you're driving home and think about what you heard. God loves you. He offered one sacrifice for sins forever. It's not that every time you come, you've got to repent of your sins. Once forever. So what do I do if I fall into sin? You know what? Acknowledge it and say, Lord, you know what? I can't control my language or I can't control this. I don't know why I do that. But I recognize that this was paid for already on the cross. And I am grateful for the blood that was shed. The Lord changed me so that I yes. want to honor that sacrifice by living a holy life. And I cannot do that with my effort. I pray this in Jesus' name. Believe me, God will answer that prayer. God is looking for willing children. Not everybody's willing. There's a whole bunch of children. God has many, many, many children. But Jesus has very few disciples. Mm -hmm. Because you have to come. Come unto me, O you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you tired of trying to please God? Are you tired of trying to work your way in, of giving your tithes and your offerings, which are important? It tells us, we say, Lord, you're in charge of my finances. But you know what? God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. Mm -hmm. And He wants your mind. Mm -hmm. He wants to have dominion over those thoughts through the Holy Spirit. Casting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against our knowledge of God. You know what exalts itself against the knowledge of God? Every time we get afraid that we're going to run out of money, that somebody's going to take our house or our car or, or our business, and the fear comes in. That's a thought that's exalted itself above our knowledge of God. Because anyone who hangs on a cross and dies a horrible death like that will not let you lose the things. And believe me, if you do, Jesus said, no one has lost mother, father, families, homes, that he will not get a hundredfold in the kingdom, for righteousness sake, a hundredfold in the kingdom, and besides that, eternal life. So if you lost a home, you're going to get a hundred, hundredfold home. And I remember when I got that revelation, I said, well, okay, my house is... 1,080 square feet, so 100 times, wow, that's a pretty big house, a warehouse. I was almost hoping they would take the house, because then I'd get a warehouse, and I'd be able to live in it, and be able to have the church there too, right? And you laugh at it, but I was afraid. And it took Pastor Terry to tell me, it's going to be all right, I believe that, and you know what, she was right. So why didn't God move so soon? Because there are still lessons I needed to learn, that Sharon needed to learn. This was a journey of our church family that prayed and went through this with us. And I know that if they had the resources and the money, they would have paid off the house and would have done because their hearts were with us. But their wallets weren't able because God didn't allow it because a lesson needed to be learned. I am the Lord, your God. I am the Lord, your provider. Mm -hmm. Jehovah Jireh. Because if your problem is solved like that, but you don't learn the lesson, and you don't understand well, how much was done for you on the cross, it can happen again. 
the enemy will have ground to come in. But if God closes that door, believe me, whatever, he opens doors that no man shuts and shuts doors that no one can open. Mm -hmm. There are openings in our hearts that the enemy still has access to. And right. the mess that we're in and the circumstances that we're struggling with, God is using that to close that door one last time. Mm -hmm. And let, never let the enemy have access to that part of your heart ever again. So that's why he said, rejoice in tribulations. Why? Because the working, the testing of our faith work in patience. Mm -hmm. And patience, perseverance, mm -hmm. and perseverance, hope. Mm -hmm. And that, I hope one day, no, biblical hope, which is a joyful and confident expectation of good. Yeah. That because of that cross, I can expect good from God. Because even though I may be stupid and I may be struggling with my issues, he made one sacrifice for my sins forever. All my sins are paid. Even the ones I'm in the middle of are paid. There's nothing keeping me and separating me from God. And he will be merciful to my unrighteousness. And that my sins and my iniquities, he doesn't remember anymore. He said, what are you talking about? What, don't you see what I just did? He's like, I paid for that already. Why are you still grieving over something I already paid for? Stop and be healed yeah. and receive my healing. This is your God. Yeah. And that the Holy Spirit is not here to convict you of, of sin, but of righteousness. It's to remind you, yeah. hey, pay for. Yeah, but I'm still afraid. Pay for. I still worry and I'm doubtful. Pay for. Yeah. Stop worrying. Don't worry about it. God is not going to ever be angry with you. There is nothing you can do. You cannot sin. The power of that cross is such that, you know, some people who hear this message will be like, what is he talking about? Yes, let me tell you something. The power of that cross is so tremendous. You cannot sin your way out of the kingdom. It will affect the quality of your life. It will cut your life short here on earth. But it will not cut your access to heaven. It cannot. Or else his blood means nothing. So there is now therefore no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus because you belong to him. The power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. And become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness. That means my own effort to please God and through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. It was faith that saved you. It is faith that will preserve you. It is faith that will keep you. It is faith that will hold you. And what is faith? Trust in God. Mm -hmm. Trust in God. You can't see Him, but He's there with you. He is with you. He is with you. And grace is not an excuse for sin, which we talked about. But let me tell you something. Meditating and focusing on your sin, which means like, you know, what I'm going to, you know, people think, well, I don't listen. listen. We're not perfect. We get afraid, we get fearful, and we doubt. Fear, doubt, and unbelief. Three big ones that, of the first people who get hurled into the lake of fire. So I'm going to deal with those because I don't know there's a human being on the planet that has, does not struggle at some point or another with you. Because let's face it, the scripture says the enemy will come in like a flood, but it says, but the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against me. And that standard is that cross. The enemy has no right or access to you anymore unless you give him access. Mm -hmm. You belong to God. God has an obligation to take care of you because you are his and to keep you safe. You have to blow through a lot of stop signs, a lot of stoplights to cut your life short here on earth. I'm here to tell you because even if it takes for him to show up he will do it. He did it with me. I was waver, big time. And I remember where I was when I, the first time I heard the audible voice of God. And he said to me, if you don't get your act home, I'm bringing you home. Mm. If you don't get your act together, I'm bringing you home. I turned around and was like, what? And I was in the army, out in the middle of nowhere with my team and all this other stuff, you know, whatever, chilling, we would buy nice water. I said, hey, what'd you say? I oh, wouldn't say anything, Sarge. Yeah. I heard it again. I said, all right, stop messing around, guys. I didn't use that language. I used some other, not choice language. Sarge, we didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. 
Didn't think anything of it. So, uh, whatever. And the next day, I almost died in a helicopter accident. Almost got killed. And as I was lying there, getting ready to get medevac to an aircraft carrier, I looked up at that tent. I said, okay, you got my attention. I know it's you now. But guess what? I don't know how to come home. Because I was so far from home. I didn't even know I didn't get home. I didn't know. And I felt an overwhelming peace come over me, like it's going to be okay. And I was that lamb that he grabbed and he pulled on his shoulders and brought home and he rejoiced. And if he did it for me or nobody, he'll do it for you. Mm. Nobody goes to an early grave unless they sign their own death certificate, unless they ignore that voice, unless they ignore those hands, unless they ignore that calling. God is not around trying to kill people. He came that we might have life and have it more abundant. Amen. Amen. There are no wayward children that belong to you that God will not bring home one way or another. Trust me. A lot of prayers went up for me. And I'm here because of that. Those prayers. Paul said, I become one with him. I no longer count my own righteousness through obeying the law. I become righteous through faith in God. But God's way of making us right with him health depends on faith. When you are right with him and you get saved and you wander, he will bring you home. He absolutely will. He has a duty and an obligation as your father. Now, in the book of Galatians, Paul was telling the Galatians, you guys started this race well, and then all of a sudden you guys jumped off the rails. What happened? Who's deceived you? False teachings. And God will judge that person. Let me tell you something. There are people today getting up on pulpits, putting yokes on the people of God. God will judge that person. And if they're a child of God, they will be, you know, listen, Jesus himself said, if you do something negligently, you will be beaten with a few stripes. But if you knew better, you're going to be beaten with many stripes. What's the lesson? You're going to get beaten if you don't preach the truth. That's why I never wanted to be a pastor. Because in all my craziness, I understood the solemnness of what this office meant. And the goal, the intent, and the function was to unveil the heart of God and let people know that that cross took care of all of it. That's the function. So, people are going to get judged, if you will, disciplined, lose reward, because they're making you feel further away from God. Yes. If you go to church and you feel the same way that when you leave as you came in, something's wrong. Amen. The revelation of God's Word should draw you closer to Him. Right. Because, unless you're not saved, that's a different story. But if you are truly born again, and you know you gave your heart to God at some point when you were young or whatever, you can't tell me that all of a sudden somebody unveils this overwhelming love that God has for you and that's not going to draw you close? That's not going to make you feel better about yourself? Whatever situation you find yourself in? Keep your mind clear and alert. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion as he looks for someone to devour. Mm. See, we're not all devourable. He is lurking to try to find somebody he can swallow up. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know how much you're loved, you will get devoured. Mm. Because this is all about love. I'm here to tell you, this has nothing to do with your sin, because your sin was paid for on that cross. Once for all time removed. Once for all time. So forget about it. I don't care. I'm not giving you a license to continue in whatever lifestyle you're in. I'm just saying forget about that and move that to one side. This is all about God's love for you. That is what's going to keep you. And you need to be honest with yourself and with the Lord. You say, you know, Lord, I, you know, I'm in this situation. And I know how to get out of it. And I've been there. And then it's up to him to solve the problem, not yours. Remember, you don't belong to yourself. What did David say? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Is he your shepherd? That requires discipleship. Mm -hmm. That requires yielding to the Lord. Because if we're trying to make ourselves right by keeping the law, 
we cut ourselves off. That's what the devil wants you to do. The devil wants you to work hard at being good. Right. He wants you to work hard at being good. Mm -hmm. He wants you to be like, no, you've got to remember, you've got to read your Bible, you remember, you've got to pray. And then after a while, you're praying, and you're saying the same things over and over again. You're just praying, blah, 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 and Jesus name, amen, and off you go. I take my five minutes, okay, let me read the scripture, blah, 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 God so loved the world, okay, let me just move on. There's no substance to it. I've said this once to, uh, a long time ago, actually, to uh, a guy. I said to him, listen, women know when men have lost interest in them. Your wife knows when you're no longer feeling very romantic towards her. Because even though you're doing things, there's no emotion in it. Mm -hmm. There's no excitement in it. Now, if a woman can detect that, imagine the one who created us. Right. He knows when you're just going through the motions. Amen. But are you excited? Okay? Because, see, you need to still pray for me, because when it's time to come home, I am usually not driving pretty fast to get home to this woman right here. Because I miss her. So I try not to break the laws, but it's a little difficult. But I do. When you love someone, you want to be with them. You want to be with them, and there's nothing that you wouldn't do for them. See, love is proved out. Right. By its actions. You can tell somebody I love them. Oh yeah, I love you, you know, I'm there for you. And then you're not there for them. When they have a need, you don't help them. Listen, people think it's about the money. It's about the heart. Amen. Yes. Okay? It's about the Amen. heart. Mm -hmm. I've gotten gifts that were $5. But what touched me was the heart of the Amen. person. And going out of their way and selecting the card. And, right. and getting a little... And they knew that I liked the particular thing. So they gave me a gift card. And it wasn't for much... But I'm not looking for the dollar amount with the heart and say, hey, I loved you enough. Mm -hmm. Right? So love is demonstrated. Love is, yeah. you, 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 can, you, you can't fake that. If you tell somebody you're with them, your actions will prove that out. Mm -hmm. You'll always try and find ways to, to do things for them, to go out of your way for them. You know? Ask the Terry who's not here today. Mom always knows my favorite cookie, those Windsor tarts. And every chance she gets, she gets me those box full of those things, man. And I'll, she got them for my birthday. I'll, you know, they didn't last very long. But, you know, <laughs> and they were huge. But it was the heart that said, hey, I remember these are your favorite cookies. It wasn't a $500 gift. It was a gift that said, I love you, I care for you, and I know that this means something to you, so I'm going to give it to you. Well, think about it. What do you think his heart is for you? He demonstrated it that day on that cross. He knows your secret desires. He knows your secret dreams, your secret hopes. He knows the things that you won't utter to anybody else. He knows it. So if, if mom can go out of her way to get me a, a box of my favorite cookies, what do you think he'll do for you? When the silver and gold and the cattle on a thousand hills are his. He'll give you everything. That's right. Like Sister Magdalene said, he'll give you the factory so you can make your own cookies. <laughs> and make as many of them as you want. But that's your God. But our conscience, our thought process, is what messes us up. 1 John 3.21 Dear friends, if your conscience doesn't condemn us, we have confidence before God. If you... My... My one thing that I, and I'll tell you my own personal journey, is I worked on my conscience in my relationship with God. And how He perceives me and how I perceive Him. That's where He started with me. And here's why. Because if my conscience was condemning me, I didn't have any confidence to ask right. God. Right. I didn't have confidence in prayer. Mm -hmm. I pray for people for their healing, and I would hope to God that God should know, oh, I hope you're listening to their faith, because I don't know if this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And God is no respecter of persons. But do you have, if your conscience doesn't condemn you, what does that mean? I'll give you an example. I don't think Pastor Sharon's going to mind, but Pastor Sharon used to have problems with her toes. She had hammer toes. And she used to get excruciating pain when we first got married. Now, one night, when we were living in our apartment, right, um, this was like the first year of our marriage. And uh, she said, man, I'm in so much pain. I heard a little voice that says, pray for her. And I was like, pray for her? I mean, I won't get into details, but the guy, I am not the man that I am today that I was back then. I'll just leave it at that. And I was like, well, who am I? I'm nobody to pray for this for her. She goes, pray for her. 
pray for me in the heart. So I was like, okay. So I said, you know what, let's pray. And you know, usually we pray, we close our eyes. I kept my eyes open. <laughs> and I looked at those toes. And I said, Lord, and then, and, you know, I started, scripture started coming to my mind. And I had an expectation, I had confidence to pray for those feet. And I will tell you, I saw those toes go like that. I almost passed out when I saw it. <laughs> and I was a nobody. You don't have to be a somebody to get something from God. You are somebody already. You're his child. And he loves you. He loves you. But do you believe that? Because when your conscience tells you you're not enough, you need to cast down that imagination. Yes. Mm -hmm. If it does, if your conscience, if your thoughts don't condemn you, then you can have confidence with, before God. But what is that confidence that you know my God is going to take care of me? Mm -hmm. I'm not worried about that bill. I'm not worried about that situation. God's going to come through. God's going to heal my husband. Yes. God's going to bring my children home. Mm -hmm. Confidence. Not that I'm doing more, I'm going to go to church more or tithe more. No, no, I don't need to because once for all the time, all my sins were paid for. Anything that disqualifies me from receiving from God was taken on that day. Lord, I pray with the confidence that comes from the blood that was shed for me on that cross. Mm -hmm. I acknowledge my sins, Lord. I acknowledge that I am less than perfect, but I don't need to be perfect to receive from you because Amen. I am yours and you are mine. And with that confidence, I pray over my husband. I pray over my wife. I pray over my children. I pray over whoever it is that you would reveal yourself to them and bring them home and heal them and do this. That's not how she bind. That is true biblical fact and truth. God's word is both true and it is fact. We live our lives based on human fact and not on the truth of what Jesus did for us on that cross. And when our conscience get so saturated with the presence of God that it doesn't condemn us anymore, you will see before the cries on your lips, God will answer it. Because you have confidence. See, Jesus said, according to your trust in me, be it unto you. If you don't trust him, nothing's going to happen. Maybe that healing or maybe that uh, financial miracle or whatever. Listen, I'll speak for myself. When God revealed this message to me and I was like going, wow, okay, I had to change the way I think. I had to have metanoia. I had to have repentance. And say, you know what? Yes, my conscience was condemning me. Mm -hmm. And the Lord was like, that's why, that's why I can't do nothing for you. Because everything was done for you on the cross. Mm -hmm. But faith unleashes that. And what is faith? Confidence before God. Mm -hmm. I am confident of this one thing. He who has begun a good work in you will continue to perform it. That was Paul's confidence. That God who started a work in the church will continue. God never, ever leaves things half finished. Three quarters finished. He goes all the way. We used to say when I, when I, the Lord brought me home and some of the brothers that were in the church were, were paratroopers like me. He said God was the first paratrooper because he goes all the way. He doesn't go half the way, three quarters of the way. He goes all the way. He makes a commitment and a promise and he keeps it. That's why we can have confidence. You know the scripture says the joy of the Lord is your strength. Yes. God's joy over you being his child. That's your confidence. Amen. That's your strength. Amen. It's not, you know, Metamucil or, or Viagra or all this other stuff. That's your strength. God's joy over you yes. being his child. That's your confidence. Yes. That's why you can pray. Not because you're anything special. You don't need to be a pastor for God to do. I wasn't a pastor when I prayed over her, Pastor Sharon's toes. One thing, one thing only, washed in that precious blood. Amen. And if you are, you have the same access to that throne that anyone else has. Amen. Don't ever, ever let anybody think that you are less than. Yes. That you're a second class citizen, that you're this or that. Never. Amen. God did not birth you into the kingdom to be slaves. You serve from your heart if that's God has put that desire in your heart. We receive offerings that people bring because we have had our offerings rejected at churches. Yes. We will not do that. Who am I to judge? Well, this is God's church, not my church. It's not the church of Joaquin or Sharon. It's the church of the firstborn. And we are all a family. And we should be honest and open and have the open dialogue. You know, I never like the fact that if a preacher wants to address something, it's like one person sitting all the way in the back and he'll slap 500 people to get to that one person. 
talking about things. And then you're sitting in there thinking, oh, maybe he's talking about me. Because trust me, that's how the devil works. Mm -hmm. No, the only thing that needs to be coming from the pulpit is God's love for you. Mm -hmm. It's all been paid for. It's all been resolved. It's all been taken care of. Right? He will rob you. See, you know, it, it, once you put, it will rob you of your Christ brought right and confidence to boldly go before the throne. If you can put a doubt, you're going to shrink back. I guarantee you, that most people that have difficulty in prayer is because they have no confidence before God. I guarantee you, people who pray, and, and, and Elder Larry knows, he prays with, he's, he's like one that leads a lot, prays with a lot of people. As they come to a greater awareness of how God loves, he's told me their prayer changes. It goes further, it goes deeper, and it goes longer. But at the beginning, it's very guarded because they're still focusing on their own shortcomings. Don't. Man, get somewhere, even if it's in your car, and let it loose. Mm -hmm. And start praying. Mm -hmm. Start worshiping him. Start telling him, you know, and whatever scripture, you don't got to know a lot. Just know what you know. Amen. <laughs> All right? Stand in what you know. Amen. John 3, 16, for God so loved Joaquin, I personalize it, that he gave his only begotten son, that Joaquin, who's a mess, would not perish, but have everlasting life. And Lord, I am grateful for my life that you gave me. I'm grateful for the life of my wife that the enemy tried to take five and a half years ago. And you didn't let him. And I start going and going. Next thing you know, you look at your watch, it's like an hour and a half just went by. <laughs> Two hours. It's not rocket science. And for those that are spirit-filled, you might even break out into a, a, a spiritual song and singing in, in another language. So what? Which, by the way, we don't disqualify anybody for if they're not spirit-filled. That's just... We are all God's children, all washed in His blood. And there are no second-class citizens in heaven. You're either a child of God, or you're not. Mm -hmm. That's it. And if you're not, you're not going to be up there. Because there's only people up there are His children and His angels. That's it. Let me tell you something. Eve fell, and so many of you, the devil said to him, did God say that? You know, let me put it very practical. When I was going to lose the home. What makes you think? What makes you think that God is going to spare you from losing your house? What makes you think that you're going to be able to, to keep your house? And I was like, you know what? I had to pause for a minute because in that moment, I did not have the confidence to say because the word says. Instead, I started rehearsing my problems, my shortcomings, my issues with driving, and the temper I get when I drive. I'll admit it. Lord knows. And by His grace... You know, and, you know, got some speeding tickets lately. <laughs> because I didn't know there was one of those stupid cameras there. So it was like, and it cost me $150. So you know what? I said, I better start driving better because I can't afford this. You know, this is funny. <laughs> but did she beat me up? No, she said, honey, just be careful. Miss. That wouldn't have been the case 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. We've been married 26. Mm -hmm. But we have both seen God's grace in our lives. And I'm going to tell you something. When you know that God has been gracious to you, it is going to be very difficult for you not to be gracious to somebody else. Amen. When you yes. know what God did for yes. you on that cross and how much he, puts, he put up with you, yes. and he doesn't remember your sins anymore now, all the stupidness that we do all the time, and he still showers grace upon grace upon your life, let me tell you something. You're going to find it really difficult to be ungracious to somebody else. Amen. And if you can, and if you, somehow manage to be ungracious, get ready for the belt. Because that's something God does not tolerate in us. For us to be unkind to our brother and sister. Discipline will come. In love, no judgment, none of that. There's no more judgment for us as God's children. But discipline, that's a whole other issue. A whole other issue. But she forgot. And he said, what hast thou done? And the woman said, the serpent has caused me to forget and I did eat. Every time we fall into sin, it's because we have forgotten who we are in Christ. Amen. Every time that anybody has ever fallen into any kind of sin, adultery, fornication, lying, cheating, anger, right? Somebody hurts us, the same thing, we react in violently, or we get hurt and offended, or this and that and the other, it's because we have forgotten what Jesus did for us on that cross. Because if you remember God's patience with you, you're going to be patient with someone else. But you need to remind yourself of that truth. Because yeah. you're not going to remember it like that. Mm -hmm. It requires a disciplined mind, mm -hmm. which is one of the fruits of the Spirit. 
The fruit of the Spirit. One fruit, many characteristics. She forgot that she was already like God. God made man in His image and in His likeness. Let me tell you, grace in the Hebrew means I bow to an inferior. Think about that. That's grace in the Hebrew. And grace in the Greek is the divine influence upon the heart and the heart's reflection in the life, especially gratitude. You know why we're not very grateful people sometimes? Because we're focused on the wrong things. If you focus on that cross and what he did for you, and you are still ungrateful, honestly, I'd have to question your salvation. And I don't like doing that. That's not my place, that's not my business, it's not my problem. But I'd be like, you know what, sister, we need to pray for your salvation. You know what, brother, you need to get saved. Because there's no way you can focus on what he did for you and still be miserable. That's impossible. God's standard is so high that he sent his son to die your death and my death so that we would be his children. Because he knew we couldn't meet the standard. So you tell me, if Jesus died to bridge that gap because you couldn't bridge it, what makes you think that showing up to church more and tithing more and praying more and having more quiet times is going to make God be pleased with you? He's pleased with you because of that blood. We tithe out of a grateful heart. Amen. We serve out of a grateful heart. We pray and we worship out of a grateful heart Amen. because of what was done on the cross. We don't try to earn it. It's already ours. Mm -hmm. But we react and respond out of a gratefulness. Out of, Lord, you know what? I didn't deserve this. And I still got issues that you're still working me through. I'm still pushy. I'm still manipulative. <laughs> right? I got all these problems, Lord. And I'm very sensitive. You know, I get offended easily, but I'm grateful for the blood. Amen. Amen. And I yield those areas to you because I know you're going to work it out. Amen. It is you who is at work in me both to will, to give me the willingness and the ability to do according to your good pleasure. Amen. That's where it works. See, what are you looking at today? In the wilderness, when the, the Israelites had been complaining the bitter waters of Mara, and, and they were whining and complaining. And so I'm, I'm going to abbreviate it for the sake of time. And what happened? God allowed serpents to come into the camp and bite people. Right? Actually. The people of Israel set out from Mount Hor to take the road to the Red Sea. But the people grew impatient with the long journey. I was one of them. Right? Oh, hurry up, Lord. What are we waiting for? Let's go. Right? <laughs> And they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? There is nothing to eat here, nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manna. Mm. Manna was the food of angels that they were eating. And they despised it. Mm. We get that way. God's grace preserves us in difficult times, and we despise it. No, I want a job making a lot of money, so I don't need, I won't need your grace. <laughs> If we were honest, we'd never actually say that, but let's face it, that's exactly what we're saying to God. Right? So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. I'm going to tell you this, and we're going to get ready to close here in a few minutes. When we start complaining, we drop that hedge of protection. And the enemy can come in and bite us. The enemy can come in and bite us. And as a result, what are we bitten with? Bitterness. Mm. A root of bitterness springs up and many have been defiled. That word defile is the physical defilement. Mm -hmm. In order for the enemy to kill you, he can't just have a, you know, this concept of that you can walk out of your house as a Christian on your way to work and a bus run you over and you die is ridiculous if you know what Jesus did for you on the cross. The scripture says that the keys of death and Hades, hell, and hell itself are in Jesus' hands. What does that mean? Nobody goes to hell unless he signs off on it. And nobody dies unless he signs off on it. You need to let that sink in your mind because many of us are afraid to die because of whatever the doctors have been saying or whatever. Death is in his hands, mm -hmm. not in the devil's hands. Mm -hmm. You want to plead your case for staying here on earth? He's the one you talk to, not doctors. And I'm not telling you not to take medication. I'm not saying that. But when you plead your case... Really, what do you plead in your Lord, I want to live longer? Lord, give me a revelation of what you did for me on that cross so that the life that is already inside of me in the presence of the Holy Spirit 
may spring forth and quicken my physical body, yes. that I may remain to hear that trumpet sound and yes. meet you in the air. You think God will not answer that prayer? They complained and they whined and the enemy was permitted to come in and they broke through. And then they came warning, because you know, that's how we are. When things go bad, we say, Lord, help me. Oh, Lord Jesus, help me. And we go for prayer, and please help me, because I'm in this situation, I'm in this problem. Right? And pray that the Lord would take away the snakes. So he did. So they made a replica of a snake, which is what the doctors used with a pole. Mm -hmm. Just as the serpent was raised in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus was that serpent. And all who were bitten, all they had to do was look at it. What are you looking at today? What are you looking at today? Are you looking at your problems? Are you looking at your physical ailments? And trust me, listen, I know, I know, I've been there, where I had something that was incurable and, and was constantly somebody yelling in my ear, and the doctor said, there's nothing we can do, we just have to medicate you for the rest of your life. And I wept. And the Lord said to me, you know what your problem is? I said, that's why I'm praying. I kind of want to know what's wrong with you. You don't believe that you are fully sanctified through the blood of my son. I was like, what? How could that be? And you know what? I did not have that confidence. I didn't. But now I know that no matter how messed up I am, that blood was enough. More than enough. I'm loved no matter what I do. And it doesn't mean I go out and do whatever I want to do. But it does give me peace and yes. security in my heart that I am loved yes. and that God loves me and God takes care of me and God washes over me and the areas that I am having difficulty and challenges I yield it to Him yes. and he makes, he makes it all work out for me yes. so as we get ready to close think about what, what, what's holding you back because today is the day today is the day Today is the acceptable year of the Lord. Today is the day that God is here. You've heard the word. Mm -hmm. It was longer than what I usually preach, but I felt in my heart God wanted this message to go out via the internet and in person. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have a time of prayer, and then you know we're going to have communion, and then we're going to we're going to have just sing a couple of songs, and then and then we'll end. Father, we just thank you for your love for us and your care for us, Lord. Mm -hmm. We are so grateful for your love and your heart of love for us, and your heart of compassion for us, and, and the care, Lord, that you take for us each and every day. And Lord, I, we just pray right now in the name of Jesus that whatever is holding us back, whatever is keeping us from soaring to the heights that you pay for me to soar, for each one of us to soar, may they be removed, Lord. Yes, Lord. May we be, be released in confidence and in assurance of who we are in Christ. Lord, may the words that were spoken today be sealed in every heart, be sealed in every mind, and may it transform us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What a deeper and a greater revelation of your love for us, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.